Thanks. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Braden Tondre. He has uh, been my graduate student for the last couple of years. Uh, he's majoring in agronomy with his uh, pursuing a master's of science degree. Uh, he started out in my lab as a student worker and uh, did a, a fair middling job there. So I, I kept him on as a graduate student. And uh, we had a unique project uh, that was needing some attention in Azerbaijan. And uh, I'm going to let Braden tell you all about Azerbaijan. But uh, uh, since then, uh, it looks like Braden may have uh, gainful employment at the USDA pecan breeding program. So he must be good at climbing trees and, and harvesting pecans. So anyway, uh, I will turn it over to Braden. All right, howdy. Like Dr. said, like Dr. Haig said, my name is Brayden Tondry, and today I want to give a presentation over my research. So I will share my screen. All right, can everybody see? We can see it fine. All right, uh, Salam. Uh, Minim Adim Braden Tondry. Uh, howdy, my name is Braden Tondry, and today I have the unique pleasure of presenting my research over improving cotton production in Azerbaijan. Uh, bear with me, uh, it is a little bit of a death fly slide uh, PowerPoint. Uh, to give you a little bit of uh, background about Azerbaijan, um, Azerbaijan, it's a country located in Eurasia, it's south of Russia. North of Iran, to its east is the Caspian Sea, which is the largest inland body of water in the world. And then to the west is Armenia with um, Georgia to the northwest of Azerbaijan. Um, it does have a long uh, history of cotton production in the Caucasus region and was one of the largest producing states um, when part of the USSR um, ever since uh, the, dis, uh, the dissolution of the USSR, uh, Azerbaijan has uh, steadily declined in cotton production. And so to address these issues, um, AgroCenter, which is a consulting agency that works for the Azerbaijani government, uh, approached Dr. Haig and Texas A&M to perform some research trials in hopes to improve their cotton production in the region. Um, a little bit of background along uh, why the uh, cotton industry has steadily declined. Uh, much of the machinery uh, being used over there wasn't modern enough and farmers moved away from planting cotton because of low cotton prices. And um, uh, one added benefit uh, that Azerbaijan does have compared to the United States is they currently do not plant anything other than conventional cotton seeds. Uh, I think this would be a great opportunity for a country to get it right and uh, to make the best out of the technology that everybody has learned from. Uh, they are uh, very reliant on external sources such as Turkey and Greece, um, importing many um, seeds and fertilizers from them. Uh, in the background, uh, something that I didn't know happened was uh, much of the cotton harvested that isn't picked with round bale cotton modules is harvested and then dumped in these piles, as you can see on the left-hand screen. And because of uh, a high leaf matter, it's uh, constantly turned uh, once or twice and then sent to the gins in these uh, trailers and then ginned out on the in initially. Um, but harvested acres, like I said, have declined since uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This was because of low cotton prices and they do not have um, the best access to fiber quality testing. An interesting tidbit that really drew my mind was ever since leaving the USSR, uh, Azerbaijan was deemed the most successful in uh, land uh, uh, dissolution, um, giving land out to uh, 
families uh, that were Azerbaijani. And so m much of the farming is done by small scales in two to five hectare plots. Uh, there's a picture on your left of a Michele that really shows the size of the farmers. 90% uh, of all agriculture products um, that the country uh, produces is actually from these small scale farmers. And then on your right hand side is Garan, um, MKT, uh, which is one of the farms that I conducted my research on, is on the right hand side. Above, you'll see all these center pivots. And then to the bottom, you'll see a lot of the small scale farmers right outside. Um, if anybody could uh, really quickly answer what they think is wrong with this image, they, they're more than welcome to jump in. Um, but I'll just go ahead and tell you, uh, they are actually planting my cotton variety trial in, uh, in Garan. And I don't know about you, but usually you don't plant your cotton, you know, in uh, sweaters and beanies. So the uh, accepting uh, uh, these agriculture <clears throat> techniques such as planting cotton whenever the ground is above 65 degrees is slowly being accepted. My project focused only on cotton, but a few things that I did get to see while I was over there was their animal production. And I wanted to show you all this, just show you all how different it is from the United States um, in uh, Garan and Amishli. And so <clears throat> what I learned was that anybody that owned cattle in the city actually um, would let their cattle out and graze and they would roam around the city. You had to avoid them with your car. And then at night they would come back and you would lock them up and you do the whole thing again the next day. Um, then uh, uh, as in ancient times, the sheep were actually uh, shepherded with a shepherd and allowed to graze in uh, bar ditches and along irrigation canals and any kind of pasture land that they were able to find, they go ahead and uh, just wander around the city and you have to wait for the sheep or the cattle to cross the road before you can start driving. <clears throat> My last background slide, I wanted to just inform y'all of something that I didn't even know that was going on until I uh, heard about Azerbaijan and went over there. But currently they're at war with Armenia. It's, it's more of a paper war, but just recently um, in July, there was um, there was a uh, an incident where Azerbaijan actually attacked Armenia in this Nagorno Karabakh region, uh, and they were able to successfully capture two of the largest cities in that region. Uh, Russia, the mediator, stepped in and uh, gave the, the the rights to Azerbaijan. Azerbaijanis were allowed to move in and take the farmland back. Uh, much of the much of the fighting was actually being done on farmland, and so that farmland is now in Azerbaijani hands. Uh, that region is also going to be uh, it will also have a road put through, and they'll have greater access to uh, Turkey, which will help in trade. But also a pipeline will be going in in that region, connecting Baku over here to Turkey, which is about over here. So getting to my uh, research project, we wanted to determine an optimal rate of defoliant and bowl openers for Azerbaijani farmers, as well as MKT farmers. And we wanted to determine an optimal application rate of nitrogen fertilizer, uh, as well as identify any of the varieties that we were able to get our hands on and figure out which ones were best suited for Azerbaijan climates. And then our last trial was to compare, our, our last objective was to compare our Azerbaijan trials with trials that we grew out in College Station, Texas to see if we could compare any of those. This is a map of Azerbaijan. Um, whenever I flew in, we flew into Baku and then drove usually to Garan, uh, 
did any of our data collection and then we drove about 200 kilometers to the southeastern region to Mishli, which is about 20 miles from the uh, Iranian border. And uh, that was where our other location was. Uh, both of these locations uh, had MKT farms and those MKT farms were where I conducted my research. The, uh, the environment in which I planted these into um, like I said, they're about 200 kilometers apart. Uh, all of them are irrigated using center pivot irrigation. Initially, has hot, dry summers, um, and it doesn't get a lot of rainfall. And then the average annual temperature is between 29 and 97. Uh, it does have a high saline content in their irrigation water. And then Garan has a similar climate with hot, dry summers, very little rainfall throughout the growing season and then annual temperatures between 39, between 32 and 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Azerbaijan is actually unique in that it has nine out of the 11 growing climates uh, throughout the country, which sets it apart from other countries. And uh, as far as growing cotton, these two locations fall below the 39 degree parallel, which researchers argue is the um, parallel for growing cotton. Anything below that, you would be able to grow cotton. Our first um, trial was a defoliation trial that we added in 2019. We had seven uh, combination rates of BASAR, which is a defoliant, and then sun final, a bowl opener. Uh, we applied these treatments in eight row plots that ran the length of the field of a, of a center pivot irrigation field. Uh, we utilized one field that was only planted in GW Bamba, separate from all our other research plots. Uh, each treatment was replicated three times and was randomized. And then we collected all of our data from the middle rows, row four and five that had a representative um, area in the plot. Uh, we collected leaf percentage drop, uh, open bowls, green bowls, uh, and then we collected our fiber and got measurements, um, HVI measurements and APHIS measurements. Uh, the treatments are on your left if you wanna take a look. Our defoliation results in Garan. Uh, treatment four was the only uh, treatment that had an adequate defoliation rate. Uh, we determined that single application rates of small amounts of base start and sun final were actually inadequate in defoliating the crop. But other than that, just treatment four was um, the only adequate defoliation treatment. Looking at our Michley uh, trials, uh, Treatments four, five, and six had the best initial defoliation uh, with looking at our leaf drop percentage. And then after the second application, it can be noted that treatment four did not have a second application and ended up being one of our poorest uh, leaf retention uh, plots in the trial. With the onset of COVID, we decided to do a defoliation trial in College Station. The trial was randomized with four replications. Uh, the all applications were made on a dry land cotton field in uh, at the Texas A&M University Research Farm in Burleson County. Uh, we ended up using GenStar uh, defoliant and then Super Bowl, a bowl opener. We didn't have access to those other uh, defoliants and bowl openers in, that we used in uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, we could note that this, this field did have slight stress. Um, it was a dry year that year. And uh, any of the plots that were sprayed are applied with lower amounts of, of GenStar and Super Bowl actually had the best defoliation and uh, lock up any bulbs. Any of the higher um, application rates did have some lock bulbs in their, in their plots. 
the next trial that we did was a variety trial. Um, in 2018, we had access to 10 varieties. And then in Garan, we had access to nine. We weren't able to get G one of the varieties, I think it was GW Bamba in Garan. We just didn't have time at the end. And then in 2019, we had um, those varieties on your hand screen. Most of these varieties were sourced from Turkey and other neighboring countries. I believe Greece was one of them. Uh, in 2018, they were randomized and planted in one row plots that ran the length of the field. Uh, it was replicated three times and uh, data collection was done in 10 row plots uh, that was a representative sample of the field and harvest was also done on 10, 10 meter sections as well. And then in 2019, we changed up the project a little bit and we had a randomized complete block design that had three replications. And these varieties were planted in two row plots. And in 2019, Caitlin Lakey and myself and Dr. Haig were the only ones harvesting these plots. And so we decided to harvest a five meter uh, section of the, the plot that was representative to the plot. Um, there were a lot of skips and weed pressure, and so we tried to narrow it down to uh, just five meters. Uh, here's a picture of one of the Civil War sacks that we used to harvest the, uh, the plots. I believe this is in a, in a Michele. And then uh, everything was ginned out on a laboratory roller gin. Um, on your right hand screen, you can see that. Uh, it's just a small scale roller gin uh, that we were given access to in Michele. Uh, we harvested the five meter plots, weighed them in our Civil War sacks, and then we took a 200 gram grab sample um, that was representative in the bag from the bottom, the middle, and the top, and then ginned all that. And then we took a 40 gram sample for fiber testing that we sent off to Texas Tech um, for APHIS and HVI, HVI measurements. Our variety trial results in Garan. Uh, May 505 did have the was one of the highest yielding varieties with uh, 2421 kilograms per hectare. Uh, the, per, uh, the lint percent was acceptable at 40.4. Uh, we can conclude, or we, we noted that uh, looking at these results from Garan that there weren't many differences in weight. And this was because the uh, the plots were well taken care of and well weeded. Our variety trials in, uh, in Garan from 2018, we had uh, HVI measurements from uh, the Texas Tech Bipolymer Research Institute. And we found that uh, there were not many differences except for May 344 did have a lower strength and grams per text at 27.9. Cotton ranges from 25 to 45 grams per text. And uh, the Micronair was acceptable and none of these varieties should receive, would receive a discount if they were grown in the United States and sold. Our Michele results uh, from our variety trials in 2018, did um, have about 300 kilograms less than what was found in Garan, or grown in Garan. Uh, May 505 uh, was our highest yielding variety. Uh, our, our lint percent was about the same at about 40%. And uh, we, we uh, looked at why this was uh, such a low yielding location, and it was because of the salt presence. Many of the uh, plots did have a high weed pressure, and you can see salt accumulation. I took my finger and I just went down the row so you could see it on the left-hand side. Our, uh, our fiber data from Amishli uh, was actually really interesting in terms of Micronair. Uh, all these 
varieties would have received a discount if they were marketed in the United States, except for Golden West 2345, which fell below the 4.8 units. Um, uh, every other variety would receive discounts. Uh, our length is also reduced compared to Garan. And uh, that was our fiber data from HVI in 2018. This was an interesting picture that I uh, took while we were in Emishley. You can see the monster pigweed uh, right below the sign. And the other interesting uh, reason I took this picture was the placements of the uh, sprinkler heads was really high compared to what it is in the United States. And since they are uh, irrigating with um, a brackish water, a high salinity water, uh, it would probably be best to, we told them it would be better to drop those, those sprinkler heads below into the crop canopy in order to apply as much water to the ground in order to leach those salts and prevent any kind of evaporation and salt buildup on the soil. This was our um, results from Garan in uh, 2019. Uh, PG Lima and May 455 were the highest yielding. Uh, we did have GW Bomba again, once again, uh, one of the lower yielding varieties. Uh, percent, the lint percent was also acceptable at 42.1. One. Uh, thing we did different in 2019 from 2018 was we sent off APHIS measurement samples. Uh, we took an extra sample, or we, we had the same sample measured for APHIS, or using APHIS uh, in Garan. Um, there weren't many differences among uh, varieties, except for GW Bomba, which did have a larger upper quartile length um, and a lower maturity ratio. Uh, this was one of the lower yielding varieties as well. So poor fiber quality and poor yield. Uh, we suggested that it shouldn't be planted. In 2019, uh, in Gran, uh, the HVI measurements, once again, uh, this field was very well taken care of by the uh, farm manager. And so Micronair uh, did we didn't have any varieties that would receive a discount as far as Micronair. And, uh, and overall, uh, Garan did have a, uh, a strong fiber content and, um, and was well taken care of. In, uh, in our variety trials in Emishley in 2019, uh, we noted that PG uh, Lima and May 455 uh, were among the higher yielding varieties. And uh, once again, GW Bomba, uh, the, one of the lower yielding varieties uh, with an acceptable lint percent. In 2019, our initially uh, HVI measurements um, as compared to Garan, we did see an increase in Micronair. This could be contributed to uh, salinity problems and salinity issues and heat problems as well as crop stress. Uh, so all our varieties except for GW Bomba would be uh, discounted if sold in the United States. Uh, GW Bomba fell below the 4.8 range um, everything else did have a higher micronair, um, but they did have acceptable uh, strengths. Uh, our APHIS measurements in Emishley, uh didn't really show us too much other than uh, May 344. May 344 had a, May 455 and PG Lima were our better uh, varieties. We showed that, or we concluded that May four, May 455 uh, was a variety that was best suited uh, for the region. It it had a uh, uh, it was a longer fiber and uh, it had a higher maturity ratio. And uh, we concluded, or we we found that it was best suited for this 
this area or this region in initially. Our last uh, trial was a nitrogen trial um, that we conducted in 2019 in Gran and Emishli. Uh, we used monoammonium phosphate and ammonium nitrate. Uh, this uh, was done on a randomized complete block design. Uh, we had four row test plots and then all our data was collected from the middle rows, so row two and three. And in 2020, due to COVID, uh, we decided to plant an additional uh, nitrogen trial in College Station to compare the results. In, in Garan in 2019, uh, P100 and P200 were uh, some of our higher yielding plots as, as well as 50 in. Um, the current practice in Garan is utilizing P200. Uh, we were able to show them the results that P100 uh, did yield a little bit higher. Uh, one thing to take away from this Garan uh, location that we used, it was actually previously planted in potatoes. And since we weren't able to do any kind of soil sampling of our own, uh, we didn't know if there were any nitrogen or um, nutrient carryovers. In Amishli, uh, the crop did yield um, a little bit less than in Garan. Uh, the current practice is uh, P200. Uh, P300 was our higher yielding variety, so one and a half times the rate of the current plan. Um, uh, the lint percent though uh, is, is fairly well at 42. I would like to acknowledge Agro Center for funding my project and allowing me to conduct uh, all the research uh, in Garan and initially and traveling uh, or taking us all around the country. And I would also like to thank Texas A&M and AgriLife Research, as well as my committee members, Dr. Haig and Dr. Uh, Josh McGinty for their support and help throughout my project. Um, also, uh, big thanks goes out to Don Dino, one of our past technicians, and James Salinas, as well as any of the undergraduate student workers. And a huge thank you to Caitlin Lakey for bearing with me and traveling on a 15-hour flight over there to help me harvest my plots and miss school, and any other other graduate students in the Cotton Lab that helped with this research project. So thank you for your attention. Um, happy hump day. And I will open up the floor for any kind of question that y'all may have, questions that y'all may have. Nice seminar, very nice seminar. Seems like a long way to go to grow cotton, but what do I know? Questions? <laughs> Just a little bit. Hey, Braden. I know, um... I mean, I, I, would, I don't think we've ever talked about uh, how similar the products are from the U.S. to Azerbaijan, um, like the chemicals you use, the defoliants. Um, I know you said they were different, but how similar are they to what we use? Um, as far as uh, similarities, uh, the defoliants and the bull openers that we use and they, that we had access to over there did have some of the same chemicals. Um, we were only able to use what we had access um, that MKT was able to get their hands on. So I couldn't tell you exactly the chemical com component uh, similarities, but uh, we used um, some of the same products that were fairly similar. Hey, this is Girisha Ganjagunte from El Paso. Um, Excellent seminar. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, you did attribute uh, a lower yield and fiber quality to salinity. Uh, do you know what kind of uh, root zone salinity uh, you, know, you experienced in your field study? And one of the management practices you uh, recommended was lowering the nozzles. But do you know what else to do? to control salt accumulation? Uh, 
Um, okay, so two parts. Uh, I do not know the rates, uh, the salinity rates over there. Um, I wasn't able to get any of those kind of measurements. Sneaking those back into the United States was a little bit, would be a little bit complicated. Um, so I could not answer that question. I would say it's pretty high, but not high enough that you can't grow a cotton crop on. Uh, they're still able to do that. Um, as far as battling um, salinity issues, I know from past classes that uh, crops such as um, alfalfa are usually used and uh, irrigated and they just pour lots and lots of water in efforts to um, leach those uh, salts throughout the rooting zone and not affect the crop. So does, uh, other than that, those are the only ones that I can think of right now. Um, okay, thank you.